We're riding the crapulent depression of Super Tuesday. If I had the 18th <laughs> premiere of Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the Karl Marx's 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Friday the 17th of April 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. What better time to kick back and read some Karl Marx than the middle of a pandemic. So get your books out ladies and gentlemen and join in. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the Marx Engels illustration book, Rono. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. This week I have the new patrons, communist Peter Hanley to thank, and also Sen, who upped his contribution level. Thanks very much. If you'd like to help support the show, get the episodes a few days early, and an extra two episodes every month, then just head over to the Patreon and throw me a few bucks. It really helps keep the episodes flowing and allows me to have the time to do all the necessary research. Okay, enough of the money grabbing. Let's jump into this new monster reading group series. Hello and welcome to the first episode of the 18 Brumaire reading group series. We have a full panel here today after a false start last week. Let's go, first of all, I suppose, over to the new member of the panel, James in London. How's it going, James? Hi, Tom. I'm good. James Knight here, alienated Marxist at large in southeast London. Glad to be here to talk some Brumaire. Okay, next we go over all the way to Canada to say a welcome back to Kyle. Kyle, how's it going? Pretty good here in a blizzard. It's 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 a good thing to be doing during a blizzard. Just sit down, podcast, no worries. Okay, and then all the way to Utah, the Narcom of Varna Nation. Narcom, how are you? I'm okay. I'm uh, replacing the bourgeois apparatus with the apparatus of proper Varna Nation, particularly after the loss of popular frontist Bernie, who has not lost yet, but he's lost. He's on the roll. Okay, and finally, a new appearer on the show. This time we have Esri. Esri is from Planet Seabong 12. Esri, would you like to say hello? Yes, yes. Hello, hello. I'm um, I'm the new host of Lexi, you know, uh, Dearly Departed. And uh, let's see. I'm borrowing some poetry from the future. Well, let's crack into this. We're going to be doing Karl Marx's 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. Who wants to give a little intro about what this is about, about what the book's about? Anybody want to give an intro? I mean, this is written when the when the commune arts get their asses kicked. This is kind of the post-mortem for that. Okay, so we're going to talk about the 18... It's basically the 1848, 1848. revolution in France. Oh, it is 1848? I don't yeah, think so. This so. Is, yeah. No, this, this no, is, no. Well, it's... it's no, it's, no, it's the, not. It's, it's the aftermath. It's the aftermath of 1848, right? Right. So it's about... The reign of Louis Napoleon, or Napoleon III, I'm sorry. It's about the reign of Napoleon III. Louis Bonaparte crowns himself emperor after... So, yes, there is like an up... There is an upsurge in 1848, and then it's followed by this bourgeois republic that gets bonaparte But it's not... Like, this is not about the 1848 that Marx, like, participated in. This is about the French stuff that he saw after he was in exile. Yeah, so it's going to be about like what was the aftermath of the revolution in 1848 and how it swung from being a republic into basically uh, an autocratic dictatorship under the control of Louis Napoleon, who was the original Napoleon's nephew. Isn't that right? So it's going to be some class analysis and some interesting stuff here and chuck block full of unbelievably good quotes. So why don't I get open here the Marxist.org translation of it and we can start reading bit by bit and see how we get on. Just wanted to add that uh, Marx was 40 when this came out. Uh, So that's that's the point in his life that this came out. We all have time. And uh, this is also sort of important in in the context of Marx because he was getting a whole lot of shit for not fighting in 1848 in Germany. Armchair fucking leftist. What are you doing? I mean, well, I mean, Bakunin is actually like 
calling him on it. That's part of what prompted this this post mortem. Yeah, that's I mean great. he's friends with Angles. Angles went out there, so yeah, the cred rubs off. But you notice that they're not talking about Germany very much. Like when they write about 1848 in Germany, um, it's almost always Ingalls writing. Marx, Marx like avoids it. Let's crack it off. I think like th- this chapter is nearly uh, wall to wall, blow, blow by blow, classic lines. So we're probably going to read quite a, f- uh, quite a lot of it. So hopefully in the subsequent chapter, which are more history dense and less kind of conceptually dense, uh, we won't have to read them all, so we won't be such a monster of a of an episode. Okay, so who wants to go first? I think we want to go first. Why don't I start off here? This version is different than my version, so we'll have to see how how we get along. We really should have all read the same version. What a what a fucking root <laughs> the error. Okay. Well, it's our first time doing this with a uh, with a text that is translated. So. Also, we should all have read it in German. That is yeah. true. Well, I have. I'll get on it. Have you not read it in German? I have. But oh, I have two. Good. I have like two different translations right here. Yeah, no, I read it in German, but I, I don't speak German. But like, <laughs> well, I didn't get much from it, so I'm relying on you people to help me through this series. Okay, Hegel remarks somewhere that all great world historic facts and personages appear, so to speak, twice. He forgot to add: the first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. So there's a lot of French words in here. Oh my god, Cassidier for for Danton. Louis Blanc for Robespierre and the Montagne of 1848 to 1851 for the Montagne of 18 or 1793 to 1795, the nephew for the uncle. And the same caricature occurs in the circumstances of the second edition of the 18th Brumaire. Men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. And just as they seem to be occupied with revolutionizing themselves and things, creating something that did not exist before, precisely in such epochs of revolutionary crisis, they anxiously conjure up the spirits of the past to their service, borrowing from them names, battle slogans and costumes in order to present this new scene in world history in time-honored disguise and borrowed language. Thus, Luther put on the mask of the Apostle Paul. The revolution of 1789 to 1914 draped itself alternatively in the guise of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire, and the revolution of 1848 knew nothing better to do than to parody now 1789, now the revolutionary tradition of 1793 to 95. In like manner, the beginner who has learned a new language always translates it back into his mother tongue but he assimilates the spirit of the new language and expresses himself freely in it only when he moves in it without recalling the old and when he forgets his native tongue. That's a pretty goddamn amazing opening for a couple of paragraphs. Sorry, I just went to church. This is probably the best thing that Marx has written, like, linguistically. You know, if you slog through capital, sometimes you're like, God damn it, Marx. But this is what he's capable of, just saying. His letters and speeches are always way better than his, as far as reading than anything else he does. Read his letters to Ingalls, they're this good. And then you're wondering, like, why is this dude writing such turgid ass prose the rest of the time? And you realize it's Hegel's fault. Hegel and political economy, but yes. Yeah. Well, you know, Adam Smith is weirdly readable. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I don't mind reading that stuff as much, but it is, it's the combination. The combination is lethal. And also it's the nineteenth century and they liked really verbose, annoying style. Don't forget repetitive. Just just read like, you know, Vanity Fair. Who wrote Vanity Vanity Fair? Thackeray. Oh my god, it's just putrid, you know. There was a certain kind of a style at the time. Or anything by that godforsaken what was it Silas Mariner? Who wrote Silas Mariner? Isn't that George Eliot, I think? George Eliot. Yeah, well, I just studied that for my from my, uh, when I was in school and uh, from my leaving search, we used to call it silage farmer. It was the worst <laughs> style <laughs> of all time. <laughs> silage farmer. So, like, let's talk here about this idea of like. So, there's two kind of ideas here, isn't there? There's like men make their own history, but not as they please. So, what's he getting at here? Choice is bounded, especially in historical in the historical scope, in terms of big actions. Like cho- choice is made, but not ideally. 
I mean, for both material reasons and for conceptual reasons. The material reasons is you have to have the base to do new things. And so this gets used for that. But in the context of the specific paragraph, he's also saying that you you pretty much don't have a choice but to turn to the traditions of the immediate past or the far past. And and it gets it gets ridiculous. There's actually a very subtle critique of Hegel going on here, because Hegel's like spiraling notion of time is is based on this idea that that spiral through its negativity unveils the absolute which is negativity invoked in the universe by god and some people say it's not god but it's god sorry it is just reminding people that hegel was a christian this seems to have another an alternate kind of materialist explanation for why that happens because you have to go to your immediate models to understand what you're doing and until you really quote, slipped into the new tongue and forget the old, you can't really move freely in it. And so you have to kind of go to this old, like, pantomiming of prior things. And in modern terms, Marx is basically saying all revolutionaries start off as LARPers. And I guess the other thing going on here is, like, he's kind of laying out a broad conceptual basis for recuperating something out of the catastrophic failure of 1848. You know, the, the reversal from 1848 to Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, is, like or Emperor uh, Napoleon III, is just horrifically depressing. And yeah. so he's trying to salvage something out of that. Yeah, I mean, not only did you lose like, um, like Louis Blanc, who's, you know, uh, is the farce of Rose Pierre, right? Cause he does his, uh, his work houses and he's the first socialist. And, and, um, I mean, one of the reasons why socialism and communism are interchangeable in Marx is because at first he wanted to distance himself from French socialism because they screwed up so bad. Like his work houses only last like a month. Immediate inc- calls for inclusion of women lead to a backlash within a month of it being opened. Like in a way the coming arts will do later in a more radical sense, but like you really have like an utter failure of the, like the first social demo- democratic attempt on the planet. Yeah. Before we get too far from the text, I want to stress that the character of the weight of the dead generations weighing like nightmare. <laughs> yes. We have to turn to the past, but how quickly it becomes baggage, bad baggage that, clouds our horizons and there's a necessity but you touch on it and you want to move on (laughs) because otherwise there's a sort of overlap with like a Rousseauian or Nietzschean kind of critique of a sort of like pig principle of tradition or something where the you know more tradition that you can get like eventually your intellectual pursuits can weigh you down your like intellectual interests, your kind of like cultural sympathies in the previous revolutions, these things become distorted and polluted. Um, and you have to be able to navigate your way out of them. Right. There's so much packed here. <laughs> um, Why don't you read the next paragraph and we'll get into this point a little bit more. When we think about this conjuring up of the dead of world history, a salient difference reveals itself. Camille Desmoulins, Danton, Robespierre, Saint Just, Napoleon, the heroes as well as the parties and the masses of the old French Revolution performed the task of their time, that of unchaining and establishing modern bourgeois society in Roman costumes and with Roman phrases. The first one destroyed the feudal foundation and cut off the feudal heads that had grown on it. The other created inside France the only conditions under which free competition could be developed, parceled out land properly used, and the unfettered productive power of the nation employed. And beyond the French borders, it swept away feudal institutions everywhere to provide, as far as necessary, bourgeois society in France with an appropriate up-to-date environment on the European continent. Once the new social formation was established, the Andalusian Colossi, disappeared, and with them also the resurrected Romanism, the Brutuses, the Gracchi, the Publicolas, the Tribunes, the Senators, and Caesar himself. Bourgeois society in its sober reality bred its own true interpreters and spokesmen in the Says, Cousins, Royer Collards, Benjamin Constance, and Guizots. Its real military leaders sat behind the office desk, 
and the hog-headed Louis XVIII was its political chief. Entirely absorbed in the production of wealth and in peaceful competitive struggle, it no longer remembered that the ghosts of the Roman period had watched over its cradle. We should probably just mention a little bit about the original French Revolution. The first Re French Revolution was what actually he's talking about here, which, which caused the establishment of pretty much a bourgeois society. It came to pass initially, there was a problem in the French government that the, the, the crown was basically broke and they wanted to reorganize the how they taxed. Because at the time you had lots of different tiny little areas in France with their own laws and their own taxes and everything was super inefficient. And also the, the landed gentry were paying essentially no tax and it was a real weight on the economy. So they decided to have to convene the estates so to basically replan the economy and things went bat batshit wrong and essentially what started off as a basic tax reform thing ended up going first to a kind of a bourgeois revolution and then the the radical republicans of Robespierre and them pushed it forward towards something closer to a social uh, revolution i actually don't agree with that interpretation what I don't think they got all the way to social art, but they they got beyond. I the... don't even think that was their goal, though. One, they suppressed a lot of the socialists and the enrages. Two, like they were just the most radical front of of rights. That's what that's what their actual platform was. It was a you know a a moralized like proto Kantian republic of virtue that they were interested in. There is this tendency that socialists have to go back and make them proto socialists, but they're they're not. There were proto-socialists in that movement, but they, I mean, like in, in the French Revolution, but they were not actually the, the, the Jacobins of the mountain. The Jacobins were the absolute vanguard of like, of the bourgeois. Republican. Yeah. No, that's fair enough. That's a fair point. Yeah. I, I kind of over pushed it there. Derek, take a, take a, take a stab at looking at, at talking about this paragraph here. Well, oh, uh, well we should just mention that there's the whole section of this that, is about Napoleon overcoming those people and bringing bourgeois law to Europe in general, right? Yeah, I mean, interestingly enough, the the, the spreading of bourgeois law requires the the subsumption of bourgeois republicanism into bourgeois imperialism because it's modeled on Rome. And what I actually find fascinating is is a a, a gaping gap where people talk about Marxist Eurocentrism, and they're kind of right. If you pattern the, the American Republic, which also patterned itself on Rome from the same time period with the same, uh, with, with the same European philosophers at the basis, uh, you don't get the exact same model. Like what spreads the bourgeois sentiment in outside of Europe is a settler colonial republic of liberty. And it's Republican, like explicitly. That's interesting to me. And, and like, I'm not saying Marx is wrong here. I think I think there's like, if you want to go into historical model tensions, there's different things going on. This is like, as an English teacher, I'm just amazed at the parallelism here. Um, I'm actually don't like the uh, the translation on Mar on Marxist.org because like it breaks the paragraphs up differently than, it's, than it is in the German. And so you miss some of the parallelism. But when he goes through the uh, the French le French leaders and he, he actually has perfectly paired them off <laughs> with the different movements of the Roman collapse into into the empire. So you have like the the kind of reformists are like the Brutuses and then the Gracchi. Then you have the publicists and you have the tribunes and then you have the counter, you know, the counter revolutions of the senators and then Caesar himself. And that's supposed to perfectly mirror what happens with the various factions being overcome by Napoleon. And and then, and then if you go back to that for, to that second paragraph uh, actually, to the first paragraph, when he when he's like, Cursed the air for Danton, because of the air is like an early reformist, as was Danton, although Danton gets, you know, purged in a kind of stupid way. And Cursed the air just kind of gets retired. Louis Blanc for Rose Pierre. So Louis Blanc's like, the, you know, the most left wing vanguard of, I think Marx would say he was a petty proprietor, but of that movement, you know, the workshop movement. And he's like a farce of, of, of Rose Pierre. And then, you know, yeah, and then you have the two mountains, and you know, like the the, the mountains of far, like the mountains are farce of the mountain. So, it's it's funny what he what he's doing there, and you're basically seeing like these reformist attempts and these radical attempts that are emerging up, but they're not even as they're like cheap knockoffs of the immediate preceding epoch. 
but they're not dressing themselves in Roman garb anymore. They're now dressing themselves in the immediate last Republic. And if he, he actually does, I mean, one of the things that I, I never, when I read, when I used to read this, I didn't realize that Marx is basically admitting that the English civil war is the first bourgeois revolution in this paragraph, but he is, but he talks about like why they had to go to the old Testament for their bourgeois revolution. And because it was so early on that their only models could be religious. And so they're kind of play acting that. So, you know, um, Locke becomes like the, the, the farce of the old Testament prophets and like, Habakkuk. So it's it's funny what he's saying there is like the you have to go to prior models. Once the prior models are once you get a new model, it's established. You don't need the prior model anymore. But it's kind of a farce of the prior model because the context is wrong. And then you do it again and again. But what you know, and it's seemingly getting you know rapider and rapider. For example, like for the English, they're having to go back four thousand years. <laughs> for the French, only two. For the new French Revolution, like only twenty. Well, let, let, let's just read that. I'll read that paragraph that you were just talked about here, just to put that into context, what we said. But unheroic though bourgeois society is, it nevertheless needed heroism, sacrifice, terror, civil war, and national wars to bring it into being. And in the austere classical traditions of the, Rom of the Roman Republic, the bourgeois gladiators found the ideals and the art forms, the self-deceptions that they needed to conceal from themselves, the bourgeois limited content of their struggles, and to keep their passion on the high plane of great historic tra tragedy. Similarly, at another stage of development a century earlier, Cromwell and the English people had borrowed from the Old Testament the speech, emotions, and illusions for their bourgeois revolution. When the real goal had been achieved and the bourgeois transformation of English society had been accomplished, Locke supplanted Habakkuk. Yeah, so there's, like, there's kind of a secondary point in there I, I really like as well, where he talks about like the self-deception. It's, uh, no, it, is, it is really interesting, and I think that that's something that's kind of coming up again and again in the text, is how that between the different epochs, when people aren't even kind of recognizing that what they're doing is a repetition, so there's a, a degree of self-deception there. You know, they can't even see that the errors that they're making have already been made, and that they're repeating it, as he says, as like a form of farce of something that's already existed previously. Is there the sense like that they are talking about all these things about, you know, you know, freedom and everything like that. But when it comes down to it, they really just mean, you know, freedom for the bourgeois. We're, we're not talking about everybody, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Then, yeah. Well, OK, but I, I think it's really important that we like we skipped over this whole point here that Marx brings up in the previous paragraph where he says, uh, Bourgeois society and its sober reality bred its own true interpreters and spokesmen in the Says, Cousins, Loyal Corrales, Benjamin Constant, and Guizot. This is, I think, a really good point that once Napoleon is gone, you get these like political economists and historians of bourgeois thought who take on a very unheroic quality, right? Like, that is the sort of unself-deceptive form of bourgeois thinking that arises. And this kind of like take that Marx has on the latter-day bourgeois thinkers is a thing that kind of comes up throughout Marxism in subsequent years. Like I am really thinking here about like Hobbesbaum I'm thinking about uh, like Franco Moretti has a really interesting essay about bourgeois aesthetics and how they go from a kind of severe and heroic phase into a very sentimental and romantic phase. And there's a kind of constant throughout Marxist thinking of like a disappointment in the bourgeoisie, right? That they become so complacent and self-absorbed and and unheroic and pathetic you know is is there nearly like a kind of a a self-disappointment of in the bourgeoisie well self-disappointment that they're concealing from themselves yeah or is it that they know that at, at some stage i get the feeling when i'm reading marx in here is that like is that the, the actual bourgeois themselves are kind of self-disappointed at how you know mm. they they're, they're not themselves really being well, you know, idealists. Yeah, yeah. I, you get you get things like C.S. Lewis or Tolkien, which are like 
attempts to create in a romantic or mythical genre something heroic that can succeed the revolutionary heroism of earlier bourgeois eras. You know what, though? Mm. Th- there's a tendency for that heroism to become immediately reactionary. I mean, you see that in um, even in the French context, and it's not mentioned because Marx doesn't mention the reactionaries very much, but it, like Demestre, who mm-hmm. immediately rereads the French, you know, the French Revolution as necessary to bring about something like Louis Napoleon and the disintegration of the Orleanists and the Bourbons and the restoration of them, which, you know, Demestre was right about. What's interesting to me about about this, too, is there's a lot more, I think there's even more implied here about the necessity of self-deception, that the self-deception mm-hmm. isn't just about the bourgeois, because he's also implying that the, that the Romans were self-deceived that Roman society collapsed under the weight of its own, of its, of its own inability to, to live up to its own ber- uh, virtues, probably for material limits. I mean, we forget that Marx, in addition to being a Hegelian, was a classicist, right? He does some things where he conflates Greeks, uh, Greece and Rome a lot. It's kind of annoying, but like, <laughs> he's, a, he's a classicist. His, his dissertation was on Epicurus. So like, this is not something that's, un, that lo- that's lost on him. I think if you also, if you read, for example, his letters to Lincoln, where he talks about the bourgeois revolutions are necessarily unfinished because they cannot deliver everything to everybody. He's basically appealing to the fact that many of the bourgeois leaders and and stuff actually know this and are bothered by this too. In In fact, if you think about it, socialism isn't possible unless a faction of the bourgeois leadership is disaffected by it because it's not like the original leaders of socialism and communism were from the working classes. They weren't. Marx knew that. Marx wasn't an idiot. So I'm not sure how much this is critiquing the Roman Republic as much as the way that the form of something will be eclipsed by its content. So like the, the skins that the bourgeois revolution wants to wear you know, will give way. That's the comment about the Old Testament at the end, is that the Old Testament was borrowed in a similar way. But I don't think it's it's too hard to make a generalization that because of this bourgeois limited content of their struggles and their need to keep the passion on the high plane of great historic tragedy, that you could make, you could take the bourgeois limited content of their struggle and make it, you know, X, where X is, a you know ruling class or something or potential ruling class potential exploiting class in a mode of production and extrapolate this in like a historical materialist way well i i think what what's interesting about this is we're gonna have to i mean i don't want to bring up this can of worms but you actually have to consider how much you think marx is an absolute formalist on this like, is he a true Hegelian or even an Epicurean, which, you know, like Epicurean materialism is formalist. It's not like empiricist, like we think of it. Explain what you mean by a formalist then, Derek. Well, for example, Epicureanism, its critique of, say, Platonism is that it couldn't reduce things to the, um, to the smallest forms that could possibly exist. That's where our atomic theory and Epicureanism comes from. But the forms are real. They're really emergent from the interaction of these smaller forms. So, like in Epicureanism, you have something like a, like a emergentist metaphysics. For example, Epicureans are sketchy on whether or not they believe in gods because they believe that the gods might be real, but they're physical beings emergent from forms compounded together like humans are. And so, Marx actually like when some of the weirdnesses of Marx's uh, kind of materialism. If you read like some of his writings on science and his obsessions with math have to do with that and how much he abandoned that to me is an open question because he doesn't write about it directly but when you read stuff like this is he positing this first as tragedy then as far as a like as a hard historical rule in which case if it's a hard historical rule it's not just bourgeois society it's going to do this like this will be the results of any class society until class is overcome right but that latter part is maybe the most important. So there's the general rule, and then there's a constant gesture that 
this revolution, the, the proletarian revolution, cannot do the same thing. It cannot keep itself in class limited terms. Like it cannot have a class limited content that it obscures to itself by using myth to dress it up, only to give way to you know a pragmatic bureaucracy of you know mediocrity, right? Like, so are are we saying here that like Brexit has overcome this? Is that what we're saying? <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, that's a, that's the wrong swamp side member. The um, Brexit is like the yeah. the final the death of class in, in mm -hmm. politics. Oh my god. Yeah. Um, no, no, no the, really very much the opposite, right? <laughs> like it is it is conjuring up the ghosts of the British Empire to create this political movement. So. It is a decadent bourgeois revolution. And I'm not like huge on, on capitalist decadence theory, but I got to say reading this, I now see that it's implicit in Marx. Mhm. Mm yeah. 100%. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Let me just clarify, I was actually totally joking about Brexit. <laughs> in case. We have people who <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. not as a joke, though, so be careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do, yeah, we do have people in, in our circles that might might be compelled to make that as a troll argument and then maybe start believing it. Okay, well, we move on here to, say, the next bit of text here. Kyle, do you want to give it a go? Thus, the awakening of the dead in those revolutions serve the purpose of glorifying the new struggles, not of parodying the old, of magnifying the given task in the imagination, not recoiling from its solution in reality, of finding once more the spirit of revolution, not making its ghost walk again. From 1848 to 1851, only the ghost of the old revolution circulated, from Marat, the Republican Grand Jean, uh, Republican in yellow gloves, who disguised himself as Old Bailey, down to the adventurer who hides his trivial and repulsive features behind the iron death mask of Napoleon. A whole nation which thought it had acquired an accelerated power of motion by means of a revolution suddenly finds itself set back into a defunct epoch. And to remove any doubt about the relapse, the old dates arise again. The old chronology, the old names, the old edicts, which had long since become a subject of antiquarian scholarship, and the old minions of the law who had seemed long dead. The nation feels like the mad Englishman in Bedlam, who thinks he is living in the time of the old pharaohs and daily bewails the hard labor he must perform in the Ethiopian gold mines. Immured in this subterranean prison, a pale lamp fastened to his head, the overseer of the slaves behind him with a long whip, and at the exits a confused welter of barbarian war slaves who understand neither the forced laborers nor each other, since they speak no common language. And all this, sighs the mad Englishman, is expected of me, a free-born Briton, in order to make gold for the pharaohs. In order to pay the debts of the Bonaparte family, sighs the French nation. The Englishman, so long as he was not in his right mind, could not get rid of his idée fixe of mining gold. The French, so long as they were engaged in revolution, could not get rid of the memory of Napoleon, as the election of December 10th, 1848, when Louis Bonaparte was elected president of the French Republic by the plebiscite, was proved. They long to return from the perils of revolution to the flesh pots of Egypt. And December 2nd, 1851 was the answer. This was the date of the coup d'etat by Louis Bonaparte. Now they have not only a caricature of the old Napoleon, but the old Napoleon himself caricatured as he would have, have to be in the middle of the 19th century. Rip. Kyle, you're reading slaps. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so you can actually, you have a great, great tone, like good audio book, booming tone, and you uh, also can pronounce the French. Thank God. Thank God we <laughs> called in a Canadian. Right. Yeah, because yeah, uh, if yeah, you make me too. pronounce the French, like it'll just go, like we'll pronounce it eight different ways in the same podcast. Like it'll be bad. And look, I, I've learned from the best here as well. So. Uh uh, unfortunately, you're going to get the Quebecois pronunciation, <laughs> pseudo Quebecois pronunciation of the French. 
<laughs> Whatever. I mean, I don't care if the square head is speaking frog. It just needs to be done. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kyle, tell us now, like, how much am dram have you done? Have you, like, done some, like, singing, chorus line work, all that kind of nah, stuff? I'd, I just play a lot of tabletop RPGs. <laughs> That's the That's the so... Um, and the Garth of Zagron zaps you with his death ray. <laughs> <laughs> Which does sound very narcomy. Um, I want to make a point on this, though. It was always interesting to me that that, that uh, Hannah Arendt, who everybody hates, I have a soft spot for, but um, Hannah Arendt says Curb the same... your enthusiasm theme plays. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, says the same thing as this paragraph as a critique of Marxism and doesn't seem to realize that Marx had already realized it. And that is, and you get it when Marx talks about Marast, who um, I just butchered that name, but you know, uh, Marie, Francois, Pascal, Amon, Marast, who called for the 1848 mass protest. But um, as soon as things I got out of hand and got too radical, called for their suppression. And I think about the quote by Arendt, by Arendt, Sorry, I'm now faux speaking French and a German, German Jewish name. Um, that the revolutionary becomes the conservative the moment after the revolution to maintain what they think the revolutionary goals are. And, you know, they suppress the more radicals. I mean, this was true for Rose Pierre suppressing the Enrages and, you know, the atheists and whatnot, too. And that they end up being like the, a, a new form of the Ancien Regime almost immediately. Like Marx sees that and sees that tendency as a thing that creates the farcical, you know, return of Napoleon and Napoleon the third. Yeah, definitely. It's very insightful because we do see it come up again and again down the line. Like this is really, really good observation of history. And of the tendency to get lost in history. It's exactly the process. It's something that I think about when dealing with uh, McNair. McNair is like, in my view, one of the best attempts to try to abstract, you know, some like analytic strategic sort of principles from the socialist tradition, you know, accumulated experience of the 19th and 20th centuries. You know, it still strikes me that in the, you know, McNair appreciation kind of society groups, there is more than a bit of this. And it doesn't seem necessitated by the attempt to abstract from socialist history. Um, Let's go into the next paragraph, because the next paragraph is pretty damning. The social revolution of the 19th century cannot draw its poetry from the past, but only from the future. It cannot begin with itself before it is stripped of all superstition in regard to the past. Earlier rep revolutions required recollections of the past world history in order to drug themselves concerning their own content. In order to arrive at its own content, the revolution of the 19th century must let the dead bury their dead. There is a phase that went beyond the content. Here, the content goes beyond the phrase. I feel like this makes all our current LARPers revolutionarily suspect, even when they're play acting the Soviet Union. It, most especially when they're playing the Soviet Union. Yeah. It gives lie to the idea of an orthodox Marxism as a political practice you might want to recall some like methodological or I don't know, some of the content of what Marx is saying and, or tr try to reconstruct it in an analytically sort of defensive way. Like there are things that you could do that have like a sort of, I don't know, like sense of loyalty about them as intellectual exercises, but to do this with the revolutions of the past the way that people do is explicitly unkosher <laughs> to Marx. Yeah, un until like commies and, you know, I don't know, socialists, whatever we want to call ourselves, yeah, you know, until we land our poetry or whatever, you know, in a kind of a futurist element, like where is all the futurism gone from, from socialist left? An awful lot of them just, it it's all about the past. It's about, oh, what do we think of Castro or what do we think of this fella? So much of the argumentation is like that. How many futuristic socialist commie podcasts are there where they're talking about our communist future? Is, is General Intellect Unit like the only one? That was kind of the point. So, yeah, I hope so. 
<laughs> or I hope it's at least one of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I had this paragraph triple exclamation marked in my copy because it does seem, as we've been saying, like it's a very explicit and quite kind of curt rejection of this idea that, you know, we have to be, as we've said, so many of these kind of contemporary revolutionary ideologies do look backwards and this seems like a quite kind of explicit and curt kind of reputation of that which i have both triple exclamation mark and underlined let's i want to i want to like draw back a little bit though because one of the things that makes this fascinating and marx had only come to this conclusion historically like Marx doesn't like say we only just need to think about this future and start planning. In fact, if you look at the history of Marxism, that's the first thing it rejects is utopian socialism, which is totally future facing in this sort of like we can do the roadmap way. And Marx thinks that's silly. What you have here, though, is this thing is you can't play act the past. You can't use it to cover up the fact that you don't have your own content. You can't emerge fully with content. You go back to that thing about men make their own history, but not by, but not by the means they want. That's that's also limits the future orientation. So you're you're actually in. It's not just a singular bind against the larpers of the world. It's a double bind. Yeah, but was Marx not more against the utopian socialists, more based on like their moralism? No, he was. He, his specific problem with them is they tried to world map something you could not know. But was it also not a kind of a moralism that you need the conditions to change? You know, the material conditions that they were kind of, you had these utopian societies all the way through history as well that existed. It was also a critique that you need. I, I, I think I, I think you still get into, you get stuck into things with, when you read the critique of the Goethe program too, where Marx refuses to speculate on what higher phases of communism would look like other than the base more, and frankly, moral indiction from each to you know from each of their own ability to each of their own need, which was not even his phrase. I mean, that's taken from a French socialist. He's saying that you have to be future oriented, but you can't say what the future is going to be, which is really hard to motivate people to do. Because yeah, you're but- asking them to take a leap into the unknown. Yes, yes. That that I that I think is the Marxist position, right? Is recognizing our historical involvement and wanting to see something new, but also because of that historical recognition, seeing that it's yeah, it's exactly that. It's a leap into the unknown and planning the future is futile. It just reminds me of like when was it ben- Benjamin talks about the prohibition about the Messiah in Judaism, where it's like, yeah, you you can't know what is going to come. You just can't know. It's really a difficult position to be in. But I feel like Marxism really puts us in difficult intellectual and historical places all down the line like that kind of deflationary dimension to marxism it does require a certain kind of really kind of uncomfortable historical consciousness On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats.